Hey, it's me. So, today, this evening, I went to a seminar on human trafficking. It was very interesting. Um, it really was. Uh, didn't, uh, I, I didn't really know how to, I mean, I didn't, it didn't answer anything the way I was hoping it would, but I mean, I don't know what I mean by that. I didn't get answers from it that I was hoping to get, but, um, it had a much broader definition than I expected it to have. And so, I mean, it isn't just about people who go missing, which makes sense. It's also, I mean, it makes sense. It's not what you'd expect, but a lot of people who are human, who are trafficked, who are victims of human trafficking, aren't even necessarily, um, you know, aren't even necessarily missing or moved or anything. They, it can happen in their own house. Slavery, slavery, um, and, you know, prostitution, and those kind of things. Anyway, so I went to that tonight, and, uh, I got back home, and I took my usual post, uh, midnight walk with Tucker, and we're walking, just get, just got started walking, and walked past this house, and was just, like, struck by this powerful smell of natural gas and it was like right out in front of this one house and I thought well that's you know that's strange I'll I'll just keep walking and then see if you know when I come back I'll see if it's still you know if I still smell it and so um it was just like a 15 minute walk maybe and so I came back and I didn't smell it anymore um there was a breeze and I wasn't sure where it was in the first place just that, that I, I didn't know exactly I didn't know where the source was so I thought okay well I don't smell it now so it's probably you know probably nothing and so hang on a second hi there it's Tucker hi buddy oh I know I know you don't like that you sweet baby that's my boy anyway so came back in and I just thought I'll look it up and see what it says online and I I brought up I, I searched under the keywords natural gas smell outside and it brought up the um, energy conservation page and website actually and it said if you smell natural gas outside immediately report it and so I thought well I hate doing that I hate doing that because you know if it turns out to be nothing you feel like an idiot but then if it's something you don't want to do nothing and have people die from carbon monoxide or gas you know um, so anyway I I called 911 and this cop came and I pointed him to the house because I didn't know the address. I hadn't recorded that. I didn't plan to call. I just I was kind of surprised when I said to report it. So I didn't have an address so I just described where it was and then I went out there and pointed to it and showed him where it was. And he was alright about it and then and then it was uh, customary for the fire department to come too. So two um, guys from the fire department came and as soon as they came, the, the cop just got this really condescending look on his face toward me. And he, he then he just, I would, you know, I was kind of apologizing all over the place for having called. And the paramedics or, or firemen were like, you know, better safe than sorry. And one of them thought it might be coming from the treatment plant, the sewer treatment plant, sewage treatment plant, um, lovely, um, you know, and the cop just stood there with this really belittling look on his face, kind of freaked out when I 
I, I freaked him out a little bit when I, I said, you look familiar. And he was like, mm, with this, this really, I don't know, it was just this awful look on his face. I don't know how you can make a look like that. I just, I don't, I don't, I, anyway, I freaked him out because I said, is your name Brian? And he's like, yeah. So... I, I actually didn't get his last name right, though, because I was thinking of an entirely different guy, so it was just a coincidence, but, um, or I have seen this guy before and didn't know his name and just don't remember, but it's so weird. I mean, it's so predictable, though. The fire department comes, and they're professional and polite, and the cops come, and they're condescending, and they make you feel stupid for calling. And I feel stupid for calling. I wish I hadn't because of how it turned out. Um, but I'm, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to have the guilt of having not called and to have something happen to those people. But anyway, just made me think about people who like to make other people feel stupid. I know a whole group of people who like to make other people feel stupid. And by other people, I mean me. And not just me, but in that group, me. Uh, when I was at that seminar, the very last quote that the very last speaker put up was a quote by Desmond Tutu. And I really liked it because it applies to my life a lot, <laughs> um, as well as to um, the lives of the people that we were... The, people who were being trafficked, but there was quite a bit that I took away from, you know, relevant to my own life, to and situations that I've been through. And the quote is, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. That's very true. It's very true. I mean, and if you are, anybody can probably relate to that in the sense that if they have felt oppression, if they have felt um, unjustly treated, or particularly, I guess, actually I'm saying if, if you've ever felt like you need somebody to defend you, you need somebody to stand up for you, and they don't, they, they are, it, it, as far as you're concerned, they have taken the bully's side. If you're being bullied and there's somebody there and they see it and they do nothing, then they become part of that whole bullying entity. They do in your mind. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's, it's the way it is. That's the way. It's the way society is. It's the way most people are. I just think most people. I don't know why, but it seems like most people are bad. Most people may not be evil, but more people are bad than are good. I don't have any doubt about that. I just don't understand why. I don't understand why. And whether you're popular or whether you're liked or whether you're treated well has nothing to do with whether you're a good person or not. That is not that is not a quality that people care about, really. You don't it's not a it's not a virtue that people particularly look for, I guess, in other people. You know? So I guess most people aren't disappointed. I guess that's a way to look at it. So I had a talk with my mom a long talk with her last week. We had lunch. Had a long talk with her. I finally asked her, you know, how come you never said anything to me after you read that article about me? You, you never said anything. You never said you were proud of me. You never said you liked the article. You just never said anything. And if I was ever going to make you proud, it would have been, would have been that. I mean, but, you know, and she, she then said, you know, she was proud of me and she's sorry that she didn't say anything. 
I asked, you know, did my brother see it? Because I want him to be proud of me, but... You know... That is too much to ask for. My brother is a total baby. 54-year-old, bratty, manipulative baby. My brother read that article, and what he had to say was, she doesn't have autism. He has always maintained that I've never had it. He has always maintained that, I guess, what he's saying is that all of the weird quirks I have, and she said she defended me. I, I do believe her. She said it before, you know, she really told me what he, you know, what, how it kind of progressed. She kind of, you know, so, you know, I do believe that she, she said, you know, you know, she has all of the symptoms. I, he doesn't ever look at that. He doesn't ever, he won't acknowledge that. And I have so many of them, and I have the Hallmark ones too, you know, the symptoms that can, really can't be much else. I mean, they, they are almost def the definition of autism, you know, except the higher functioning autism. And I'm talking about things like not being able, the sound sensitivity, not being able to listen to the radio in the car drove my family crazy, D drove my brother crazy. Um, my brother is very controlling. And he lives like the rules that apply to everybody else don't apply to him. And he, do, he puts, um, puts situations in place so that it's perfectly okay for him to do something, but not anybody else. Like, he'll say, you know, I don't like being told what to do. While at the same time, he orders around other people and tells them what to do. He tells me what to do all the time. He tells me how I can think, how I'm not allowed to think, and if I don't think the way he thinks I should think, if I don't agree with something he says, well, the specific example I'm thinking of, in that case, it was Christmas morning, he went off and locked himself in his room and pouted. And he was about 51 years old then. I mean, it's kind of weird for a um, person who has meltdowns to call some, to say somebody else has temper tantrums. I I know there's a fine line there uh, as far as how they look, but one is manipulative and the other is not. And he is very manipulative, and he's very rude, and he's very smug. And he's, I really have a hard time respecting him. I don't respect him. I don't, I mean, I love him deep down, but he makes that very hard to do. He is such a jackass. His behavior is so awful. His, his, just, and, you know, I'm talking to my mom, and I'm, like, giving him excuses. I'm making excuses for him, you know, because I feel like I'm always walking on eggshells with him and with her. And I said, you know, he, pro he may have some problem himself. And she says, no, he just wants things to be the way he wants them to be. She's right. She's right. He does. I mean, he wants things to be a certain way. One time, we're, he and my sister-in-law, his wife, and his daughter, and I were in a car. It was his daughter's birthday. She was like 12 years old, probably. And we're driving along, and he's like, pull over here, to his wife, she was driving. Pull over here. And she pulls over in front of this 7-Eleven, which is where he was telling her to pull over. He gets out of the car, and he goes in, and he doesn't say anything to the other three of us. He goes in, and he buys himself a Slurpee. First of all, how rude is that, that he didn't ask any of us if we wanted something, and he didn't even bother to tell us what he was doing? He goes in, and he buys himself this huge Slurpee, or Big Gulp, whatever it is. And then he comes back out, gets in the car, and then we can leave, because he got what he wanted, and everything is about him. So he got what he wanted, and we're driving along, and he's in the, my 
my sister-in-law's in the front seat, and I'm in the passenger seat, and he's in the seat behind my sister-in-law. I get, I get very car sick, so they didn't want me throwing up in their car, which is why I was in the front seat. Um, <clears throat> but he's in the back seat behind her, and he's drinking his big gulp, and she mentions something about, um, what'd you get? And he said a Coke Slurpee, or big gulp, whatever they are. And so she's, she mentioned, she just asked him, is that diet? And it didn't sound, it didn't sound like she was being, to me, to me, I didn't perceive that she was being judgmental, but he took it that way. And so she's driving along, we're driving along, and she asks him that, and he gets really quiet, and I can see what he's doing, she can't. But he just opens the door in response to her asking if it was diet, because he's diabetic. That's why she asked. Um, or maybe she just wanted to know, you know. He doesn't exactly tell us anything. So his response was to get really mad and really quiet. And then he opened the door and threw his big gulp out the door. And then, within like one minute, he fell over so that his head was laying in his daughter's lap and faked a coma. That's my brother. And so then, and this was before my dad died. Because, I know that because, fast forward, like, I guess he would have been, I don't know what year that was, but, oh well, she was 12, she, she was around 12 or 13. She's like 18 now, so about like five or six years ago. So anyway, fast forward to, um you know, I had a few years or a year or two, and my dad is in the hospital, and he's actually in a real coma, um, and he's not waking up, and he had only been in, the, he had only been in the coma, I don't know, for, for one night or something. I had been at his bedside for 23 hours straight, 23 hours with my dad, who had gone into a coma. It was a very stressful day. It was very traumatic because he ended up dying. So my brother and sister-in-law and niece blow into town. I, I say it like that because I'm pissed at him, but they, they got there and uh, <clears throat> first thing we do is go down to the, after they visit my dad, my uh we go my brother my mom and I go down to the lunchroom and then I go I reach into the freezer and I pull out a sugared pop I pulled out whatever was the most caffeinated one they had uh I think it was surge I think they had surge still then um I mean I don't know that they have it now but they had it then I guess I don't know anyway I pulled out a surge <laughs> and my brother was standing next to me, and he looked at me, and I guess the piece of information I left out was that between the time I told you about him uh, getting that big gulp and, and the time that I got that, that, you know, that my dad was in the coma and I got that surge, I had been diagnosed with diabetes. And this one, you know, 23 hours, this one time, I reach in, I pull out this, well, I shouldn't say this one time, I mean, but... <clears throat> You know, I had been there. We go down there to the ca to the cafeteria. I, I reach into the freezer and I pull or fridge and I pull that out. And he just looks at me and I say, "Leave me alone, okay?" Because I mean, I've been here for 23 hours. I'm sleepy. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm emotionally exhausted. And so he doesn't say anything. We go into the cafeteria meet up with my mom and into the actual sitting area and we're sitting there and he says something else to me or if he didn't say it he indicated and I'm like I'm like Todd I told you I've been here for 23 hours I need the caffeine okay and I wanted the sugar but it's my business it's not his business that's the key but you know he made a second you know judgment judgmental so we leave 
I hand it to my mother because I hadn't finished drinking it from, you know, still had part of the bottle left. I used the restroom. I came back out, and he is now bitching to her about the fact that I'm drinking a sugared pop. That was when I lost it. I took the first two hits very well, and it just explained to him, and I'm like, back off, you know, I need that caffeine, you know, so he's complaining to my mother, and I hear him complaining to her. And she's like, I know. And he he does he's doing that on purpose. That's what he does. And this always happens this way, and I am loath to control me, and they seem to not be able to control them, so what happens every time we together happened then. He bitched about me to her. I started to get upset. I didn't say anything. I just started to get, you know, upset. And my mother is like, Don't you dare! That's my mother. That's how she talks to me. So, <laughs> don't you dare. You know, in this horribly scary troll-like voice. And then, of course, you know, I have my little tantrum where I just walk away and I'm angry. I mean, I didn't do anything. I just walked away. I'm furious. Then he goes back and tells his wife my great sin about my great sin. And then there's Todd and his wife and his daughter all standing there looking at me from afar, not speaking to me. My mother is not speaking to me. And from then on, we're all in separate cars because they won't speak to me. And we went through the... Uh, pretty much all the way through to um, pulling the plug on my dad and him dying without them speaking to me. And it, it started out with a pop. It was the pop for like a day and then two days, whatever. I don't know. That's just my family. That's how it is. I'm not allowed to get angry. My brother is allowed to do or say whatever he wants, and he does. And he, he can act like a baby, and he can do whatever he wants, and he doesn't like it when people judge him, and he doesn't like it when people say things to him, but it is perfectly okay for him to judge other people and for him to say things to them about the exact same thing. He is absolutely two-faced. He is. He's two-faced. And he is an absolute and utter asshole. Um, I'm the one... I'm the good child. I have been the good child my whole life. My mother finally admitted that in this last in this last talk we had. She finally admitted that I have not been the one who has been instigating all these years. It's been my brother. My brother instigates problems and then my mom goes along with it and then they don't speak to me and they treat me like I've done some terrible thing and I'm shunned and they bond over it and everybody else, whether they're my relatives or their neighbors or whatever, is told, is either told or is given the impression that I did something. And it's never me. It's never me. I'm the one walking on eggshells. I'm the one who s says to my mom, you know, if you want to marry Bill, good for you as long as you're happy. I'm not the one, like my brother, who says, if you marry him, I'll never speak to you again. That's my brother. My brother is an asshole. My brother is a total flaming asshole. He's a total asshole. I've been the good child all these years. I've been good. I have been so good, I can't possibly be any gooder. And I'm still the one who's punished. I have been punished since childhood for being, for existing, when my brother bullies me, or my brother insults me, or my brother picks on me, or decides to beat the crap out of me, and they tell me it's my fault, that I'm the bad child, and my mother finally admitted that I was not the instigator, that I never have been, and she's never actually seen me instigate anything ever, not even once, between my brother and me, except for one time she said, that our next door neighbors once saw some kind of a situation between Todd and me and they thought I started it. But they didn't see the whole thing, she said. I don't know. And I don't remember. I was a little kid then. 
they're seven years. He's seven years older than me. And, you know, he gets up there and he has little temper tantrums. That's how he gets what he wants. If I, you know, if I get angry, my mother gets angry at me for whatever my brother started. If I don't get angry, if I manage to be strong, then my brother goes off and pouts and I get in trouble. And I'm the one who's then shunned and hated. And nobody ever speaks to me. Nobody ever says anything to me about that. Like, you don't deserve that. Like, you know, they never do. Nobody ever does. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about here in real life. I absolutely hate him. I shouldn't hate. I don't want to hate. And I hate my brother. He just is so, I don't know, he's been ruining my life, my whole life, while saying that I've been ruining his life, while I've been walking on eggshells because he always gets his way, he always gets his way, always, always, always. That's my bitch session. I was thinking today, I was really upset about the way I'm treated in my course, in this group, and then I was thinking today, you know, there are a lot of people in there who don't like me, and I was thinking, if those people don't like me, then I'm doing something right. It's true. Some of those people, if they liked me, then I'm definitely doing something wrong. Because they are not good people. I'm not talking about all of them. Some of the uh, alpha dogs in there, and I wouldn't even call them dogs. I'm not going to insult dogs. Some of those alpha people who hate me, you know, if they liked me, that would mean I was a total sleazebag, I think. So, if they dislike me, then I, I'm definitely doing something right. I mean, definitely. So, anyway, that's it. That's all I've got to say today. So, thanks.